Hello, this is Mr. Gilmore with the 3.1 Part 1 Polygon Congruence. In this Part 1 lesson, we're going to define what it means for polygons to be congruent. We'll also take a look at what is the symbolism for congruence, and also how we're going to use the symbolism for congruence as we bring two polygons together to, to be congruent. We'll see how we can use that congruence and what is the follow-up of it. So imagine with me now that you have a polygon. Pick any polygon. Imagine that polygon in your head for me. Now, what you're going to do for me is create a list with your polygon. So you're going to start at a vertex of your polygon. Now that vertex, right, joined by two sides, has an angle measure there. So imagine now that you pick the angle measure for that given angle. And then what you do is you travel around the polygon, and every time you encounter a segment or you encounter another angle, you think of its measure. So we then move to the segment or the side of our polygon, and we find that it has a measure as well. And so we write that number down. And then we move to the next measure, which is another angle, and we write that number down. And we go all the way around the polygon until we've created a list of the, ang of the polygon's angles and of its side measures. So Let's then take that and let's actually apply that to a specific example together. So now here is our polygon ABCD. Now for this polygon, we have each angle measure named or labeled, and we also have the measures of each of the sides in place. So we begin to make a list of these side measures and angle measures. So as you see, if we start at angle A, angle A measures 62 degrees. We move then from 62 degrees to point B, which means we travel along the side, which is a length of 2.2, so we write that number down. And now that we're at angle B, we write down angle B's measure, 98 degrees. And as you can see, we continue that list all the way around until we have all the angles and side measures listed. And you'll notice there's a pattern, angle measure, then side measure, angle measure, then side measure, and that would happen if with any of our polygons that we had imagined. Now let's say we take this list, take this list of numbers, and let's duplicate this list of numbers so that we have the exact same list, which means we have a duplicate polygon. So now we have this identical polygon. Let's call this identical polygon PQRS. If these two polygons produce the exact same list, then we can call these polygons congruent. That is the idea of our, our our term congruence when we encounter that in geometry, we're going to see that polygons are considered congruent when they produce the exact same list. So let's make this a bit more concise definition for ourselves. So let me introduce this really quick word. The word is correspond. It means that when we build a list that the measures in the same position correspond, meaning in the first position, then it would match up with the first position of, this, of the other list. If it was in the third position, it would match up with the third position of the other list. So by definition, we can say two polygons are congruent if we can build or if we, if we list out their, their numbers, their measures of angles and sides, such that the two produce angles and sides which correspond and are equal, then we've got ourselves congruent polygons. We have a symbol for congruence in geometry. It looks very much like the equal sign. We've got an equal sign with a tilde on top of it is how we use or what we use to define congruence between two polygons. So in our symbolism, we would then write our polygons on either side of these. So you'll notice it kind of looks like two pancakes with a piece of bacon on top of it. Now, when we bring two polygons together, we'll write one name of a polygon on the left side of our congruence statement and the other name of the polygon on the right. Now, we do need to talk about the name and the order in which we name the two polygons because order matters in congruence. Think about when we talk about the list. The order of the list that we produce also matters, which means the name or how we name each polygon, the order in which we name them is important as well. Let's look at an example together. Here's an example of two polygons, ABCD and PQRS. We saw these two earlier. These two are considered congruent because they produce the exact same list. The parts which correspond have the exact same measure. So if we take a look at what a valid congruent statement would be, it would be if we were to name the first polygon, let's say we pick ABCD as our first polygon, if I were to name that ABCD, then the corresponding angles at each of those parts, A, B, C, and D, have to match up with the corresponding angles of the second polygon, which means I would have to name on my congruent statement, my second polygon, PQRS, because A and P correspond. 
B and Q correspond, C and R correspond, and D and S correspond. Another name, which would be if I were to pick a pattern for my first polygon again, let's say I go C, B, A, D. C, B, A, D. Well, then which of my, of my second polygon, which uh, angles correspond with angle C? That would be angle R or vertex R, which means I would have to travel and start with R and then move around in uh, around that second polygon in the same order that I moved around the first polygon. So I would go R, Q, P, S. That would then be a valid congruent statement. As you can see below, there are a couple examples of invalid congruent statements. This is where our vertices do not match up. They're not corresponding to those equal measures, whether they're equal angles or they're equal sides. Let's take a look. I have A, B, C, D as my first one, but then it, it starts off right, P, but then it goes to S. It went the wrong direction because S and D, uh, yes, S and D correspond, but S and B do not correspond. So I need B to be, or in the in my second statement here, I need Q to be the second statement or second vertex because that's the one that corresponds with point B. Same issue that goes on with C, B, A, D. All right, C does not even correspond with Q, which means that is not the right the congruent statement. We have to make sure that from our congruent statement, we match up our vertices. And here's why. The, ver the, the statement itself is very powerful. From just the statement, if we have a valid congruent statement, we can determine already which parts correspond. We'll see an example of this here in a little bit, where I already know from the statement which angles are equal and which sides are equal as well. Let's do an example together. Here are two triangles, A, B, C, D. Sorry, ABC and triangle DEF. We are going to then give two valid congruent statements and two invalid congruent statements. Let's start with naming our triangle ABC. So I'm going to start, say, triangle ABC. So I've picked an order. I must follow in that same order when I write out my second congruent statement because I need the vertices to match up. So which vertex matches up with, with vertex A? Well, in my second triangle, it would be point F. That's the vertex F would match up with point A. I have B second, which means I would need E second because those two correspond. And then last is D because D and C correspond. So that would be a valid congruent statement. If I were to do another, let's say I start with triangle D, E, F this time. Let's do E, F, D. That means if I were to write out a valid congruent statement, I need E to correspond with B because those are corresponding. I would need F to correspond with A, because those are corresponding, and then D and C correspond as well. So that would be a valid triangle grid statement. Now, of course, we can come up with dozens of invalid ones. If I were to say, let's start with ABC again, then of course, if I did triangle DEF, that would be an invalid grid statement, because A and D do not correspond. They are not the equal angle measures. Another one, let's say I did triangle BCA then I could do is congruent to triangle FED. That is also not a valid congruent statement because BCA, B does not correspond with F, C does not correspond with E, and A does not correspond with D. I would need a corresponding parts to match up in the congruent statement. Now let's say we're already given congruence. See, one thing we're going to be seeing in this chapter is determining congruence. Can we actually prove that we have polygons that are congruent? But let's say we are given congruence, meaning that they already have provided us with a pair of two polygons that are congruent. What does that mean that we would immediately know about these two polygons? We would immediately know that all the corresponding sides would be equal in measure and all the corresponding angles would be equal in measure. This would actually follow right from our definition of polygon congruence because we say that their lists are identical, which means all those corresponding measures would also have to be equal to each other. We want to give a name to this. We like to call this CPCPC. It stands for, here in the middle, corresponding parts of congruent polygons are congruent corresponding parts of congruent polygons are congruent. Now, instead of stating, stating that entire phrase inside of one of our proofs, it would be really helpful if we were to simplify it, which is why we say CPCPC. Now, let's say our polygons are specifically triangles. Then, we'll, then we may use CPCTC. We just take out the word polygons and replace it the word triangles. We're going to see more often this phrase here, CPCTC, because we're going to be particularly working with triangles more most often than we do with our generic polygons. But CPCTC, 
it, we know that as corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent, right? Because all the corresponding parts that match up in their lists have to have the same measure, which means those are congruent to each other. Let's use CPCTC, or in this case CPCPC, as a way to justify why we know which angles and which sides correspond in two congruent polygons. So here is an example that we are given two pentagons in which they are congruent to each other. We have pentagon A, B, C, D, E, and pentagon Z, Y, X, W, V. What we're going to do is, using the statement, since we this is given to us, we can safely say that this is our valid congruent statement. We can we can determine which angles correspond and which sides correspond just from the name of our congruent statement. That's why it's important that we have it in the right order. So let's take a look at number one together. It's asking us the measure of angle A is equal to the measure of angle blank. Well, A is in the first position of our congruence. So what would be the first position of the second polygon in our congruent statement? That would be vertex Z, which means we know that the measure of angle A is equal to the measure of angle Z. And why do I know that? Because of CPCT, sorry, CPCPC, the corresponding parts of congruent polygons are congruent. Those corresponding parts have to be the same measure because they're congruent to each other, which means I can determine this for any given angle and any given segment. Let's do another angle. Angle W from our second polygon is in the fourth position. Well, which angle is in the fourth position of our first polygon? It would be angle D. And why do we know that to be true? Again, CPCPC. The corresponding parts must be congruent of these two congruent polygons. Now let's look at CD as a segment. Okay, CD is a segment, which means C and D are in the third and fourth positions. So which two are uh, which two vertices are in the third and fourth positions of our second polygon? That would be X and W. So I know that from our polygon congruence statement that X and W, the XW, the segment XW, is the same measure as our segment CD. Why? Same reason, CPCPC. We can justify that from our congruence. Now we've got one more here, VZ. VZ. Right. If you take a look, V is in the fifth position and Z is in the first position. And we know if we were to draw this polygon out, V and Z would be connected. So we need to find the fifth and the first position of our first polygon. That would be E and A. And why do again do we know those two segments are equal? CPCPC. So all four of these are justified using CPCPC. Now specifically with triangles again, we'll be using CPCTC, which we'll see more often. To conclude our lesson, I want to take a look at uh, our justifications as far as how polygons look. Is it okay that we say two polygons are congruent just by what they look like? No, never. Not even once can we say that the polygons are congruent because they look congruent. We need to know they're congruent because we're able to prove they're congruent or they're given to us as being congruent. So the polygons below, are they congruent? Who knows? Okay. Yes, it looks like they may have the same size, same shape, and they may have the same lists, but we honestly don't know. We cannot jump to the conclusion that they are. Even if it's the right conclusion, we still cannot jump to that conclusion. However, can we prove polygons are congruent? Yes, we can prove polygons are congruent if we're given enough information. Now let's consider the polygons below. We know that the sides of all the first polygon are equal, and we know that the sides of all the second polygon are equal, but we don't know whether or not the sides are equal to each other. We know that all the angles of the first polygon are equal and all the angles of the, of the second polygon are equal, which means yes, they have this, they produce the same list of angles, but do they produce the same list for the sides? Well, let's see. The P down here stands for perimeter. If these four sides are all equal and the perimeter is 24, that means each side has a length of six, right? Six times four is 24. Let's look at our second figure over here, the second polygon. All four sides here are equal and it also has the same perimeter, which means each side is also six. So do these two polygons produce the exact same list? They do, right? It would go 90 degrees, six, 90 degrees, six, 90 degrees, six, 90 degrees, six. And that is all eight of the measures for each of the two polygons. So yes, these two polygons are in fact congruent, but we proved them congruent. We did not jump to the conclusion that they are. This concludes today's lesson on the 3.1 part one. We'll follow up some of the thoughts with polygon congruence in the 3.1 part two lesson. If you do have any questions with this lesson, please make sure you email me. I will get back to you. With that, be good and do good.